each panel, we have to have uh, a public policy influence uh, story. So before we get into the meat of the panel, and before I introduce the uh, panelists, let me, uh, let me tell you mine. Uh, it, it goes back a few years, uh, and it is not uh, quite in this region. But legend has it that when uh, Fidel Castro won his war and descended from the hills and had to select his uh, first cabinet, he gathered his sort of merry band of warriors and, and, and asked several questions, starting with, you know, who's a really good doctor? And someone raises his hand and he says, okay, you're the minister of health. And, you know, who's a good teacher? Someone else raises his hand, good, you're the minister of education. And then he goes, who's a good economist? And uh, Che Guevara, of all people, raises his hand. And after about 10 seconds of stunned silence uh, in the room, Castro appoints him as the governor of Cuba's central bank. Uh, and in fact, Che was governor for several months. Years later, when he had sort of retired, a friend of his asked him, whatever made you raise your hand when Fidel asked that question? And he replied, I misheard the question. I thought he asked, who's a good communist? So, <laughs> you know. There's, there's different morals you can, you can uh, derive from this, this anecdote, including the importance of being a, go a good listener. Um, in this panel, uh, we're going to branch out slightly, I think, uh, from the first two panels of the day, both geographically and thematically. Uh, the, question, the set of questions we've been assigned is policy influence, uh, who has it and how to get it. Uh, and I think the thinking behind it surely must be that policy influence and who wields it and how one acquires it is very situation specific and there might not be very many commonalities, although there might be some, across time and across regions and indeed across themes. Uh, we have a very sort of deep and diverse set of panelists to help us uh, get through this complex set of questions. And beginning on my far right, my friend and colleague, Antonia Mutoro. Uh, Antonia heads uh, Rwanda's premier think tank, IPAR, the Institute of Policy Analysis and Research, which was created in 2008. And so she brings to us a perspective of what it means to be a think tanker in a quite different situation than what we might find in Western Europe or North America, particularly um, doing good technical policy influence in a post-conflict setting, among other challenges. To her left is Tiffany Jenkins, who we've come across already today. Tiffany is a, a different kind of diversity in this case, but an important one. Uh, it seems to me that so far we've been dealing roughly, broadly speaking, with questions that are roughly economistic and in some cases to do with broad public policy that's in the political science and economics domain. In Tiffany's case, uh, she is with uh, a think tank based in London, England called the Institute of Ideas and she's in charge of the arts and society program there and, and that in some ways perhaps helps us also understand her very pertinent question this morning to Roger Martin about how much evidence and how much so-called scientific evidence can one have and should one have to advance an idea. And as one moves away from, from topics in the social sciences to the arts and humanities, I think that becomes a particularly pr pressing uh, preoccupation. To her left is my also longtime friend and colleague, and good to see you again, Patricio. Patricio Meller uh, from Chile. Uh, associated with very many good things which are in the bio, but in the interest, uh, for the interest of this group, associated with what really is an iconic think tank uh, in the region, uh, CPLAN, which was the only uh, allowed think tank during the years of dictatorship, and then might be, I think, correctly without exaggeration, be associated with Chile's successful uh, transition to a democracy, using social democratic but growth-oriented policies. Uh, and the folks at CEPLAN and Patricio himself have been very instrumental in our image of Chile as a thoroughly modern country today. So welcome again. And last but not least, we have my colleague David Mitchell from Ottawa and points east and west 
who now runs the Public Policy Forum and has been running it for about two years, which is, again, a think tank based in Ottawa that tries to bring together good people and good ideas in, the, in a number of domains. And characteristic of Canada's own environment, David has experience both at the provincial and federal level, uh, and so might speak also to the question of federalism and how ideas have to move often at different levels of government for them to become effective. So welcome also, David. Um, let's begin then, I think, uh, Antonia, you volunteered to go first on your take on influence, how to use it, and how to acquire it. So welcome again. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate uh, CG on their anniversary and uh, also to thank them for having given me this opportunity to share with you uh, the perspective of a uh, developing country and uh, country that is coming out of conflict on influencing policy. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is based on reflections of running a think tank uh, in Rwanda and you know, what I've learned from the region, East Africa, and more generally on Africa. So it's based on the day-to-day -day, uh, attempts to influence policy. By intro, uh, introduction or uh, think tanks actually are there to influence policy. And that's what they do every day. That's, that's the purpose. But they cannot do it alone. And that's why we need others. I think this question uh, arose many times. Uh, there's need to work with media. There's need to work with civil societies that have a similar agenda on advocacy. There's need to work with academic institutions. They need, there's need to work with development partners in Africa or donors. It, this is very, very uh, crucial. So uh, just three things uh, in my introduction. That to influence policy, you need to work with, to have partnership with those people. Uh, the list is endless. But you need to know people who are advocating similar ideas, even if they do not do policy-oriented research, but who have to take your message across and build a strong relationship with them. The other issue is uh, think tanks must understand the political context and the policy making processes, both informal and formal. If you're to make a difference, you need to understand what is happening there. And that's the challenge that think tanks face. You don't have to be too near, because if you are too near, you don't see the issues. And you don't have to be too far, because you are, if you are too far, you don't understand what's happening. So the challenge is that balance, that distance that is important. And lastly, um, very, very uh, important, you need to establish credibility. High quality is very, very important. High quality and timely and relevant research is very, very important. Now, in addressing uh, this, uh, the question on policy influence, who has it and how to get it, I want to discuss this uh, using four related topics. Number one is how do we, what do we mean by policy influence? Number two is who are we trying to influence in the perspective of a developing country? When do we try to influence policy and how do we do it effectively? So those are the basis of, of my uh, you know, contribution. Now, influencing policy, I see it in two perspectives. One is direct influence, when you know, your contribution, your research is taken by government or other people and then it's implemented. That's direct. Indirect, it's when you contribute to policy debates and change the perspectives, the direction of things. You know, you, you, you guide the conversation because you, you, you have the power of the knowledge. So that is direct influence. You may not know that things are happening, 
but people start thinking in, it, in, in a different way, in a, a way changing gradually. And sometimes uh, putting new ideas on the policy agenda, you know, people are thinking in this way and now they are changing, or agenda setting, being proactive. So, uh, one of the observations is that engaging government, which is the most important thing, engaging them uh, in, in many of your forums, in many of the debates, works better than, you know, sitting somewhere, doing a policy brief, a recommendation, and then bring it with a bang. You're going to get resistance. But if you involve them, it works. And it does not do only that, but it also increases demand for evidence-based policy making. Because government gets to understand that actually it's important to get informed decisions rather than quickly because of pressure and uh, you know, to, to, to deliver, to make decisions, just take take a decision based on a few ideas in, in government. So if you involve them, they get to know, okay, so there's demand. We need to, to request for you know, more information to have to, 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 that is evidence-based. And then you get approached uh, you know, to do work. And then it also empowers policymakers to own this evidence. So it's not done by a consultant that comes and goes, but they feel it's part of theirs because they contributed from the beginning. It also builds relationships and closes information gaps. So you know actually what's happening there rather than doing irrelevant work. And policymakers or politicians are not taken by surprise uh, if you provide, say, uh, ideas that they are not comfortable with if you engage them. Secondly, who are we trying to, uh, who are we trying to influence? We are actually trying the most, uh, and the lead uh, people are policymakers, but in developing countries, we also have to influence development partners or donors because they are key in determining policies of developing countries. So you have to make sure that what you're recommending is owned by them and, and something that they take on. Uh, the civil society as well, as I said, who are the opinion uh, uh, formers and the media. One of the challenges um, in, in our countries is that uh, there's a lack of a critical mass of researchers and of course the media also lacks capacity to, to do evidence, to have informed kind of writings. In, uh, the uh, academic community is not sufficient. I know they, 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 have, they don't have enough researchers to work on this. So that's one of the challenges. It would be easy to influence policy if you had a critical mass of researchers to call upon. So one of, that's, that's one of the challenges, but I think it's, it's, it's very critical to, to engage them because they are the opinion formers, they will support you in what you're doing. And um, above all, it's very, very important that you create a way of having the political will of the government to influence policy. Now, there's uh, something that uh, we did when we are, we are three years old. I, the Institute of Policy Analysis and Research is three years old. But when we started work, we thought, how, where do we begin? So we did what we called a stakeholder engagement strategy. We identified key decision makers in governments, in private sector, in development partners, academia, and went to them face to face, asked them what they think are the critical issues we should look at, asked them what relations, how can we engage them, how can they support us, and how, we can, how can we support us, them. And from there, we got our research agenda. And the, the, what we learned is that we needed to develop a communication strategy that engaged them always, regularly. So we developed email updates. Uh, some people read email updates, others don't. So what works really mostly is face-to-face, -face, but we can't afford that all the time. So one of the best things we could do was to say to 
develops uh, uh, documentaries uh, on TV, radio, many people in Rwanda uh, listen to radio, newspapers by elites, so it's important. But what has worked is face to face. It's easy in Rwanda to, 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 hmm. to get access to a minister, uh, to get access even to the president. It's, it's very easy. So once you have you are confident that you've got a research that is going to work, the recommendations are credible, it's easy to influence policy. Okay, yeah. And when do we try to influence policy? There are uh, quite a number of uh, forums uh, in Rwanda, for instance, where you know, we, uh, governments meet. And so those are the key forums. Also, we invite them. So it's important to know the forums where decision makers are, development partners and the media. And uh, because I have a few, <laughs> I just have to say, uh, finally, um, you have to make sure that you do a monitoring and evaluation to know what works and what doesn't work. So from our survey of monitoring and evaluation, we identified actually that engaging them you know, through forums work better than when we do uh, you know, policy recommendations and then we deliver to them. And finally, uh, I think I would emphasize that uh, you know, successful think tanks are those that have won the credibility, I mean, have won the confidence of, of governments uh, whom they think they add the policy capacity because governments in our countries lack the evidence and they, they, they're desperately looking for that. But also, you challenge them on proactive work, the things they think they should have done, and new ideas. And what has actually been more successful is when we think about cross-cutting things that across uh, the government, not for one, say for one ministry, because uh, that is something they don't look at. So when you, you have an issue that is cross-cutting and, and you put it there. And finally, I would say that uh, uh, creating a relationship based on high quality is really, really important. And, and that's what makes a difference with other you know, organizations. And uh, I, would, I would possibly say, let me stop there until you know, there are any questions I could answer. Thank you. Thank you, Antonio. In fact, I, I have no doubt that we will come back to the very many sort of issues that Antonio mapped out mm -hmm. on what it takes to not just have good ideas, but then move them in the policy field. So thank you for that. Tiffany, over to you. Or, okay. Yeah, well, um, okay? Yeah. Do you want to go second? Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Um, what I really want to say today is that at the Institute of Ideas, we don't have policy influence. And it's not just that we're incredibly unsuccessful. We don't really want it. And what I think I'll try and do is explain why that is. First, by looking at the political context in which we're working, and then how, how we work and what we actually do. So the political context is one of depoliticization. Now, this isn't a new observation. People have been talking about depoliticization for some time. But I think these, the consequences of it are serious and profound. I think we're living in a time, and I'm talking about Britain, but I'm sure I'm not talking exclusively about Britain. I think many of these trends take perhaps slightly different forms, but they do take place in many other countries, Canada um, included. So what does it mean to live in depoliticized times? Well, I think certainly our political leaders have very little credibility. I think their big ideas are very much off the agenda. Now, I'm not too old and I don't want to hark back to a past of clear-cut left and right because let's not be too nostalgic for days gone by but certainly we do live in times where big ideas are entirely off the agenda and really what you have is a series of technocratic solutions to managing the status quo and I think that is a problem. I also think that it's a problem that our political leaders do lack credibility because it does mean that perhaps they are a little bit more cautious, they don't take risks, and in the end, they really just are interested in the next six months or getting re-elected, and it means very serious problems, the economic crisis to be one, I think is almost off the agenda. 
um, and I think there are numerous other examples. Another problem with depoliticization is obviously our political leaders don't really have a mandate. They're entirely disconnected from the public, who we now call the public, as if it's a kind of strange group that we need to analyze. They're entirely separate from them. That means they don't represent people's ordinary interests, but it also means that they don't really have, that's one reason why they don't really have credibility. Now, strangely, in this context, I think it is quite easy to influence politicians, not in any kind of groundbreaking way, but certainly it is easy to have policy influence because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for really easy solutions to problems that they've identified. I don't really want to be part of that because in many cases I think that the kind of problems that they have identified are narrow, small, and not the serious ones. So why should I be giving them solutions to problems that I don't kind of identify. They want something that's fairly bite-sized. And certainly, I think what you've got in Britain, certainly, is a, a think tank land which is there to give politicians credibility by saying that we've got these new ideas for you. But there's very little difference between the think tanks and Whitehall. In fact, there's a revolving door. They work in one think tank, then they go to Whitehall, then they go back. And they're really the same people representing their own interests. And I mean, we all represent our own interests, but I think it's a slight problem when you present yourself as being from this think tank when actually you're really part of the government because nobody really takes responsibility for those ideas. There was an interesting uh, point earlier on about advocacy. And I think we can get too caught up in semantics, but one of the problems, I think, with ideas that come out of think tanks is that nobody really owns them. And that means they don't see through their implementation. That means that they're not really taking responsibility for the consequences they have. And in a context where, if you like, policy is king, where everybody's coming up with policy ideas that, in many cases, get implemented, you have all these kind of crazy policies going on being implemented by people who really aren't taking responsibility for it. And they have very serious and unintended consequences. Certainly under Blair, you had a kind of headline-driven policy-making agenda where they just wanted to show that they were doing something and they would implement policy after policy. A number of laws were passed, a number of civil liberties were removed, and that is why I'm not that keen on having influence. So often the influence I want to have is to not have those policies go through. Now, I'd said that in that context, it's quite easy to influence things. And there's, there's two ways that people do this that are interesting to reflect on. One is they use the media. I mean, the media has become the substitute for pub, pu public debate. It is really the public sphere. And there are a number of problems with that. Obviously, it's entirely unaccountable. And it just exists devoid and separate from people's real interests. We all do it, of course, but it probably gives the media far too much power in our lives. And the other is this kind of idea of evidence base, which I just want to reflect on for a moment. Now, I'm actually a rationalist gone mad. I am kind of born in the Enlightenment in my head. I'm really pro-science. But I think what has happened is that in the absence of any political authority, there's this kind of search for other types of authority. And science has been brought into that. I think it kind of bastardizes science. I mean, science is open-ended. It is questioning. It is not dogma, but it is being transformed into dogma. Now, to give you a couple of examples, because it's always good to actually kind of give a couple of examples so we don't get too confused. The Tory party in Britain is the our old Conservative Party. They're now in coalition with the Lib Dems. Now, they used to be the biggest moralists around. You shall not smoke, you shall not drink, and you shall not have sex outside of marriage. It's very clear what they thought. Now, they. They probably think that ever so slightly these days, although they're very much a hollowed version of what they used to be, which isn't always a bad thing, clearly. We don't want to mourn the Tories' demise, but they are now in power. And instead of making a number of the arguments that they used to make, say, don't have sex before you get married, teenagers shouldn't have sex, the abortion question, don't abort, is wrong, instead of making these kind of arguments on the basis of morality, these are the things that we disagree with. They now employ science to make those arguments. So it is now scientifically proven that you shouldn't do these things. Now, I think that's probably 
dodgy science. It's actually science masquerading. It's propaganda, rather, masking as science. But they use science to make those arguments. And that should kind of just indicate that that is what is happening, that it's not strictly science, but it's being used as a kind of weapon, a weapon of words when people no longer are clear to speak um, really what they think. So I think it is a substitution for political debate, and I think it is cowardly. So we don't do evidence-based either, but clearly there's some places where evidence is useful, but I think it's highly suspect when people start winning at the kind of expression, the evidence shows. Well, as you made the point, Enrico, you have to interpret the evidence, you have to explain what it means, and you have to argue what you should do on the basis of it. So what do we do apart from complaining about what everybody else does? Well, we are partisan, really. I mean, we're not partisan in the old way of left and right, because I don't think those things mean anymore. But we have very strong opinions about things. Some of them are actually pro-science. We think more experimentation should happen. Uh, we think that um, there probably is too much risk aversion in public policy making. We are concerned that, um, in a way, we are concerned that human beings are seen to be as solely as polluters rather than positive contributors to social problems. So we have very clear opinions about things, and that's why I say we're partisan. But we don't think you're going to influence that, the, the agenda by policy. We think instead what you need to do is go out and have the argument in the public sphere. So what we're really trying to do is create a public space. Um, it's quite difficult, but you have to try and win an argument over. Now, one of the ways you do that, I think, is to challenge orthodoxies and to challenge some of the kind of things that people confidently say. And actually, I think one of them is this idea that uh, we are living in the most change, changing time as ever, you know, than we've ever lived before. Thank you. I do wonder if things are changing more rapidly today than they perhaps did at the turn of the 20th century, when you had genuine globalization, when you had the suffrage is that, more than, is that more change than is happening now? I think instead we are more fearful of change. We are more terrified of what it might do to us and instead we're carrying from taking control. So the point is we try and challenge orthodoxies. We argue for a public. Now there's a lot of public engagement work. I mean, I said before they're treated like a strange group of people and people always ask, but how do you do it? How do you do that? How do you get people to kind of come to your events and what are you trying to do? And I think often the public is used in a way like science. It's used as a substitute for argument or it's used to legitimize an organization. Um, certainly with the kind of situation we have where people are very disconnected from politics, there is a certain amount of confusion as to what to do about that. But I think the way we do it is simply by having a lot of the arguments out that people have in their think tanks about the environment, about what should be done, about economic progress, about development. These are not straightforward issues. These are not unresolved. And if you ever want people to uh, win, to come over to your arguments, you have to win them over. So we do something very simple, which is called public debate. It's not overly formal. Uh, you don't have to say, Madam Chairman. You don't have five minutes to speak. But we program a lot of debates on a number of issues. And if you treat people with respect, and you treat people as if they are bright and intelligent, um, which most people are, then you can win them over. It's hard work. You have to use Twitter, Facebook, and all the rest of it. But in the end, you get them perhaps committed to you. And that can also solve a number of kind of funding problems as well. So you're not reliant on just one donor. You can be reliant upon many, which gives you a little bit more freedom. So my advice would be that it isn't always the case that you want to have policy influence. There may be other ways of doing what you want to do, because we all got involved, presumably, for a reason, not just to have policy influence for its own sake. We all believe in something, and that's what we should be concentrating on. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> very good. Very good. And I suspect, I have no doubt that we will come back to this point about whether think tanks are in the business of promoting a solution, or indeed even a set of solutions, or what, whether they're about creating the space within which other people can arrive at their own solutions. Uh, Pat mm -hmm. Patricia, over to you. Yeah, uh, I thank the CG for the invitation to participate in this interesting conference. I would be talking about think tanks in Latin America. I'm going to make six points 
and one proposal. The first point is that the reasons why think tanks have a relatively more important role in Latin America than in developed countries is the following. Latin America has a highly concentrated economic power structure which controls and has large influence in the government, controls the media and the press, in short, controls public debate. In general, in most Latin American countries, there does not exist an important counterbalancing power like we see in developed countries. New web newspapers are beginning to put issues on the table. So far, they have succeeded when traditional media picks the issues. Second point, think tanks, as we have argued the whole day, operate in the market for ideas. In Latin America, ideas are scarce. However, there is an economic paradox. Ideas have a low price. Latin American government, politicians, entrepreneurs, are reluctant to pay for ideas. Why? I'll put forward two hypotheses which are not mutually exclusive. I don't have the empirical evidence to support them. Well, the first one is that if developed countries generate many ideas which become public goods, then why should Latin America spend resources to generate ideas? The second one is that there are those who reject or fully oppose ideas generated by developed countries and generate very cheaply anti-DC ideas. The third point is that Latin American think tanks have two key roles to play. The first one uh, is that challenging conventional wisdom and in this way expanding the limits of the prevailing policy debate. The second role is that think tanks have to put the long run into local debate as a key priority. Conventional attitude in Latin America is that people have a quite high intertemporal preference for the short run. There are no scenarios about where Latin America will be within 40 years or what role will Latin America play in the future world. Fourth point, in general, Latin American economic groups are highly ideological and are not willing to support independent think tanks. In Latin America prevails the principle, who puts the money requests the music. So Latin American think tanks have a difficult problem on how to get funding. I will provide some suggestions at the end in this respect. Fifth point, how think tanks could have influence in the policy debate. The obvious, obvious way is the CIEPLAN experience. Some researchers become cabinet ministers and it's really important to become finance minister. Then you would have full influence. However, in general, influence in the policy debate is a really tricky issue. To have influence, you need contacts, links with policymakers government, political parties. But then, how do think tanks preserve independence? Six point, Latin American public opinion and people have a remarkable distrust of government, public officials, and politicians in general. The Argentinian cry of 2001 and 2002, que se vayan todos, let them all politicians go, is now a Latin American cry. However, those who are going, who go, will be replaced by perfect substitutes. Therefore, to provide consensus and credibility for a given policy, the position and judgment of an independent think tank becomes a key input in the policy debate. Latin American think tanks should do a persuasive job convincing government, politicians, vested interests about the benefits of having a technical independent opinion. Now, let me put forward very quickly the proposal. The proposal for financing independent think tanks in Latin America. Do not panic. I am talking about how to do the financing only with domestic resources. 
We are not requesting Canadian resources. Okay. The first point in this proposal is that the role played by think tanks in Latin America to improve policy making is that countries will be implementing better, better policies and will have a higher degree of competitiveness in this global world. The second point is that research oriented towards the improvement of policy making is equivalent to conventional R&D. The third point is that now there is a general empirical consensus about spending in R&D. Developed countries spend more than 2% on R&D. Country, countries spending less than 1% of GDP on R&D lose competitiveness. So the general message has been for developing countries that you have to increase spending in R&D to more than 1% of GDP. Well, I think that we should develop an equivalent empirical consensus that we have to put forward with respect to spending on think tanks devoted to research policy making. A 1 to 2% of the total domestic spending on R&D should be devoted to finance policy making research. This figure could support three to five independent think tanks in many developing countries. Fifth, an external foreign expert committee will allocate these resources among local competing think tanks. The independence of a think tank should have a heavy weight in the think tank selection together with relevance of their policy research agenda. Some people question here the possibility of identifying relevance. I would say that in Latin America and in most developing countries, how to identify relevant priority issues, it's much easier, it looks like, doing it in Canada. In short, independence, relevance, quality should be the main features of a think tank. Thanks. Thank you. Um, again, so linking uh, the concentration of power with the sources of funding is, is a subject I would like to come back to at the end of the panel, but thank you for that. David, over to you. Thank you, Rohinton. Congratulations to CG on this 10th anniversary. I think the very fact of this celebration answers the principal question of this conference today about whether think tanks can make a difference. CG's already made a difference in its short history. Um, I would like to provide you with a Canadian perspective on this question of policy influence. And I should tell you, first of all, that in a Canadian context, we haven't had a lot of big public policy developments in Canada in recent times. In fact, one has to go back almost a generation in Canada to say the 1980s for to see the last time that policy big policy ideas had an impact since that time we've seen governments more much more focused on short-term orientation around service delivery issues big policy issues have not galvanized the support of governing political parties and Parties who have advocated big policy ideas have generally not won election to government. This might say something, because if we ask who has policy influence, I think the, it's been implied already today, it's probably not the public service in Canada, which no longer has a monopoly on policy advice to governments, if it ever did. It does not have that monopoly today. In fact, it's lost its once privileged position as a policy advisor to governments and the ticket to the top to leadership positions in the public service today is much more around managerial skills than policy development skills. That's not to say that we are completely uh, absent uh, from policy development in Canada, uh, but where do policy ideas come from? Well, generally they're not generated from within government, so they come from outside. Certainly think tanks are one source. Do political parties generate ideas? Sometimes. 
do industries, industry associations, universities, pressure groups, um, others advocate for public policy? Sure, they do. But where do successful ideas come from? And who has that ability? How do you get it in a Canadian context? There are policy entrepreneurs in Canada who work around the edges, generally outside of government, who can sometimes be very effective. And I'd like to tell you just a few stories that maybe illustrate some examples around this. Uh, over a decade ago, a couple of university presidents in Canada, um, one from out west, one from the province of Quebec, made regular pilgrimages to Ottawa to advocate on behalf of increasing the research spending by the government of Canada to benefit all universities. They were advocating less on self-interest for their own institutions than for raising the bar for research funding in Canada at a very significant level. It took some time. It took uh, the building of relationships with the public service and the elected representatives. But these two university presidents uh, had an extraordinary impact on policy in terms of creation of an innovation agenda for a previous federal government that saw the expenditures of billions of dollars of funding that has benefited universities in the creation of Canada Research Chairs, the creation of the Canada Foundation for Innovation, extra funding for funding councils, Millennium Scholarships, the list is long. Uh, but this happened not from ideas generated from within government, but by university presidents from the outside who were advocating not only on behalf of their own self-interest, but of course they benefited, but they were advocating for the public interest. And I think here's one clue, that the old style of advocacy in favor of self-interest isn't so effective, but if one advocates for the public interest, uh, you might have a chance of having an impact on the direction of public policy. Another quick story. A few years ago, uh, Canada established a small but innovative um, program called the Registered Disability Savings Plan, the RDSP. What is that? Well, it's a plan where individuals or, or families uh, with individuals who have a disability of any kind in Canada can contribute to uh, a savings plan that will be matched by government. In fact, it will be double matched by government and put in a special savings account to help create financial independence for individuals or families of individuals who have disabilities, who happen to be uh, economically at the lower end of the, um, the income level in Canada. How did this idea come about? It was quite an innovation, small but significant innovation that touched the lives of many, many Canadians, most Canadians. Uh, well, a couple of small um, independent NGOs, entrepreneurs were advocating this idea from outside of government, getting the support of people within government, elected representatives and public servants to be sure, getting the support of the private sector, uh, the banks who would ultimately administer the program, um, and they were persistent. They were very persistent. It took several years. And in fact, a change of government occurred before the plan came into effect. But in, in the end, they achieved their objective. And this registered disability savings plan has now been in place for, I think, uh, going on three years now. Um, and it was the initiative of a small group of dedicated, passionate social entrepreneurs who actually made this happen. It shows you what can happen uh, with dedication, energy, commitment, passion, and the ability to be persistent and work uh, with uh, the levers in government. Let me give you one other Canadian example. Um, the Public Policy Forum, which I'm associated with, joined with about 10 other think tanks in Canada two years ago. Um, all of us were uh, concerned with the issue of energy policy in Canada. We met in Winnipeg uh, two years ago to talk about this and we became the Winnipeg Consensus Group because we met there. And uh, there are a couple of the other, uh, other think tanks represented in this room. Mel Kapp from IRPP was part of the initial group. And these were think tanks that were not associated with government, 
not associated with industry either. They were independent think tanks. And our concern was that there was a lack of coordination on energy policy and energy strategy in Canada. Can Canada is a very decentralized federation. Provinces were doing their own thing. There was a lot of experimentation taking place. There still is. The federal government was not taking any position on this. Canada was going to international conferences um, and being embarrassed because uh, we couldn't articulate a Canadian position, but premiers of Canadian provinces were taking positions, sometimes diametrically opposed to each other, and there was a question of who spoke for Canada. This group of independent think tanks met and said, look, um, we, we can do better. Uh, if, if not a policy, a strategy, a coordinated approach to Canadian energy strategy is desirable. And we started working initially outside of government, first with industry groups, environmental groups, and others. And once we found a consensus, we then took that to government. The story is not over. I don't think we can claim victory, but this summer, we met with the energy ministers of Canada, federal and provincial, at their annual meeting. And I'm pleased to say that in two years' time, we've made some progress in the sense that the energy ministers of Canada have adopted the desired goal and ambition to develop a framework for Canada. There's still work to be done on this, but I think what it demonstrates is another approach that think tanks can take. Um, these were generally not, not speaking, not ideological think tanks. These were independent, non-governmental organizations, politically neutral, who uh, took an approach that I think we can learn from. If we build a consensus outside of government on a multi-stakeholder basis, private sector, research community, social sector, if, if a consensus can be achieved outside of government first, before then taking that consensus to government, it can be irresistible for governments to move on. But if we engage governments too early, too quickly, it, it becomes more of a traditional advocacy exercise and um, they fall flat on their face in Canada today. The old style of government relations tends not to work. What I would call advocacy 2.0 is a different kind of advocacy where think tanks can and do play a role, where they search for the public interest, not for narrow self-interest, where they seek to achieve a consensus outside of government first before taking that consensus to governments and providing solutions to governments, not problems. And if think tanks can play a role in that space, I think there can be a very positive impact in terms of policy influence. And uh, further, I think there's a role for stewardship. And this is the last uh, point I would like to make, Brokinton, that governments are so focused on the short term. Short termism, as I call it, uh, really uh, dominates uh, public administration and governance in our country today, and we see it elsewhere. Very few are willing to even look out over the medium term in terms of what the policy needs are going to be and how we're going to meet them. I think public policy can be served by think tanks if continuity is pursued over a, a period of time. So think tanks have the ability to look beyond the short term to at least out to the medium term and to be persistent, not to give up, to push forward and even once the idea appears to have some traction in government, not to stop there, but to continue to provide a stewardship uh, role in making sure that that space for policy discussion, which by and large is not very prevalent today, that that space exists. And I think at our best, uh, think tanks can provide that safe space for the kind of policy dialogue that is not happening in the media by and large. Uh, we don't see it here in North America very easily. Uh, it's not happening in government very easily. It's not encouraged. Uh, but we need to have policy discussion like the one we're having here today. So I'll end my comments there, Rohan. Thank you. So thank you, David, for that very thoughtful set of comments and to underline the importance of dispassion in two ways, in terms of not necessarily advocating for a particular policy, but also to think of the long term where, and I could be wrong on this, um, as you think for the medium and long term, specific interests get blurred, and so it's, it's easier to be dispassionate when one does that. Now, while you also marshal your thoughts and gather your questions, I'd like to simply pose 
one question to the panelists, and then we will, we will come to you for your comments and uh, questions to the panel as well. And it is sparked by something all of you said. Now, I, I should say that uh, my organization, which is a research uh, funding organization, is privileged to be co-funding with the Gates Foundation, the Hewlett Foundation, uh, UK's aid agency, and the Dutch government. Uh, a global program uh, on support to think tanks in developing countries, and we have a cohort of 51 think tanks uh, that, that, that we're now covering uh, over a period of five years. One of the things we did that we commissioned uh, as, as, as a service for the cohort was a so-called policy community survey. You've seen it, uh, Antonia, because you're part of that cohort. Um, what was most striking about it was when we asked uh, various kinds of policymakers in several dozen countries, uh, mostly developing countries, but not exclusively, uh, where do you got, get your information from? Um, perhaps it's not surprising, but it's still a bit dispiriting. Uh, so scholarly papers or even policy briefs, even one-pagers from think tanks was well down the list. Uh, and things that were higher up on the list than someone like I would have imagined was listening to the radio news on, on my way to my office. And of course, things like listening to my colleagues in government and so on. So there's a certain kinship which uh, mitigates against the dispassionate and technocratic nature of think tanks. My question to each of you is, I've given you a very sort of bald summary of that kind of environment. Does it resonate with the environment in which you operate? And does it seem about right in terms of the role that your think tank has in your particular environment? And if it's OK, I'll start with you, Antonia. Thank you. Uh, I think that's a very important question. Uh, is basically. Uh, is our communication strategy working? Uh, do, does what we do arrive to the right people? So it's, it's, it's really important. I, I think I talked about uh, the, uh, the forums that we do. But most importantly, when we are disseminating our work, you look at the context. I think you know, communication is contextual. In Rwanda, for instance, uh, almost 90%, I would say, or 85% own radios. So they would listen to the radio. And what you'll talk about will be listened to. But if very few people uh, read newspapers. It would be the elites who read newspapers. So once you write in newspapers, it will be read by a few policymakers. They will read it and probably take it or ignore it, depending on the perception. But if you want to look at a wide range of, of, of audience, you use all. So you use newspapers, you use radio, you use documentaries and run them over and over again. Uh, but you also need to have individual contacts of people that matter. We call them people that matter. People who really influence pe uh, policy, people who really have decisions on certain things. And we've got our, there are telephones and, 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 and emails, and we keep sending, you know, messages. Some of them reply. Those who don't reply, actually, we know that they've read, because you, you, under, you, you can hear, you know, when you meet, you say, okay, I, I think that was uh, good, but I thought um, probably uh, you needed to engage more in a discussion. So I think uh, the way you communicate is contextual and it's different. But for us, like in our context, yes, it is, it, is, it is very, very important the way you engage, but relationship really matters because you need to have that trust, uh, especially when you're an independent think tank. They need to know that what you're providing is, 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 is uh, constructive and is evidence-based, as I said, it's important. And I think uh, in my context, it's, it's important always do an, a monitoring and evaluation and know what has worked, what was not, why, what's the next step, what can I do better. 
and it's, it's important. Okay. Yeah. Tiffany? I have, a, I have a foot in academic uh, life as well, and I was told yesterday that an article I had written, 5,000 word article I had written on my research, which is on contested authority, um, which I wrote in January 2010, will be published at the end of 2013. Now, it's too late. I mean, academia is extremely slow, and you wonder really who they're trying to talk to if it takes them three or four years to publish 5,000 words. Think tanks are certainly better. Um, they're much more immediate in their publications. Mm. Places like Demos, I'm not sure if you're familiar with them in Britain. Um, numerous directors uh, means they're not really sure where they're going, but they're, all their stuff is on the web, and you can download it for free. You don't have to pay 50 pounds or whatever it is for an academic journal. So that's certainly better, but it's still very jargon-ridden, and uh, it's still very much impenetrable unless you really know the kind of policy discourse. And I think that is revealing, and I'm not just talking about demos. I think if you really want to persuade people of something, and if you really know what you're going to say, what you want to say, then you will do it simply and straightforwardly and immediately. And not enough organizations are doing that. And it makes me think that they don't really want to win an audience, which I think is a problem. Patricia. Yeah, uh, yeah I agree that uh, radios, uh, at least in, uh, in Latin America, uh, are very important. I mean, and are very important because the Newspapers, uh, the only way you have open uh, uh, researchers are uh, writing columns, specific columns. But how many people read columns? And if they read them, how many do they understand it? So uh, and on TV, you don't get too many researchers or academics from uh, think tanks on TV. They are too boring. I mean. Uh, and seconds there are too expensive. So if you have a boring guy there, I mean, they will sap, do sapping and switch the channel. So they stay away with the academics. So, uh, but I, I will go further. I would say, and this is related to the discussion we have had this day, this morning, what do people remember one week or one day later about the ideas you have put forward. I mean, I'm, I have done the test. I was in some TV on some of the issues that were there. Some people told me, oh, I saw you on TV. Ah, yes. And what did they say? I don't remember. OK, so uh, I think that uh, the social media, it's OK to be there. But I think that the analysis and the ideas do not get through through that uh, uh, means of communication. In what we are seeing, at least in my country, it's books. Books, what are really making it, and where you could have an impact, and especially books when you address them to, to students, to university students. Especially if you are a teacher in one course, and you give your book as an assignment for them to read. <laughs> so you can be sure there. No, but uh, more generally, I would say that through university students or higher education students where you could have the impact. Uh, but uh, radio, yeah, it's OK. It was funny what you said. Uh, there were some jokes. But what remains? I mean, that's the key test. And I, I would suggest, I mean, the empirical test, <coughs> let's test one week later what people remember on some of the ideas that were put on TV, on newspaper, or on the radio by a given speaker. Okay. Think, think tanks can do a better job in demonstrating their relevance and communicating uh, their work and sharing it with a larger audience. But let's be clear, the audience for uh, policy thinking and research is not um, the entire population of any country. Uh, we're, we're in a, an election right now in the province of Ontario. Those of you who will um, be, who are visiting here, you'll notice the signs up. Uh, we're in an election campaign in the province of Ontario. Is it a very rich policy election? No, I, I would say not. Um, 
Uh, but you know, a former prime minister once uh, reflected on the fact that election campaigns aren't necessarily the best time to have a serious discussion of a policy. And uh, she, who is here today, very respected former <laughs> prime minister, was criticized for, for speaking the truth. But she was right. Um, election campaigns are about emotion. Um, um, and she was speaking the truth. She really was. Having said that, at the Public Policy Forum, for instance, we've tried to assess how big is the policy community in Canada that we wish to communicate with. How large is it? It's not very large, as it turns out. It is quite an elite uh, constituency. Uh, policymakers, those who are interested in policy, who work in NGOs or think tanks or universities or in the private sector or industry associations. It does add up, but it's still a very small community that is extremely engaged. Um, could we do a better job of reaching out even to that population? Yes. Um, I was in Washington, D.C. a while ago visiting um, with an American think tank, the Center for American Progress. It was referenced earlier today. And I think many of us are envious of the energy and resources mm. that some American think tanks have, right? The Center for American Progress, I was told at my visit, spends 50% of their budget on communication. 50%. I was asked to compare what I spent in my tiny budget by comparison. I can tell you it's not 50%. It's nowhere near. I wish. But their argument was quite compelling. Their argument was, if we can't get out to everyone who might care the work that we are doing, then we're not doing our job. It's not a bad principle to aspire to, even for those of us with modest resources. If we're not getting out the work we're doing to people who care, to whom it is relevant, then are we doing our job? And are think tanks making the difference that we aspire to? Yeah, thank you. So the floor's open. Uh, we thought we agreed previously that we would take two or three questions at a time, start with Mel, uh, and, and then have panelists respond to them. We'll, we'll come to you next. And then Enrique. Good. Um, thanks. I, I'd like to uh, come back to Tiffany and Patricio in particular and make a distinction where I think we need to unpack some of the characterizations of this. Tiffany made the point about um, having to be quick and getting your material out quickly. And you talked about uh, the length, the lag time in uh, publication in academia. And I think that's a very legitimate concern and one that you, we somehow have to deal with. But I, I like what Patricio said, which was, you got to go back to books. Now, you don't have to do a book on everything. But I do think that there's a place for peer-reviewed research that's of a serious nature. And there's a place for what I'll call opinion, but it's more than opinion, uh, where you've got a quick and dirty, or maybe quick and clean, analysis of a public policy issue. And I just think we need to separate the two and recognize that there's a legitimacy to both. Thank you. There's a question at this table across from me. Hi, Keith Heipel from University of Waterloo and CG. I'd like to address a comment to David Mitchell. I was pleased that you brought up energy policy for Canada, because I think this is a very important issue. The Canadian Academy of Engineering would like to see Canada have a sustainable energy policy, and they've done a lot of work in this direction. They've also tried behind the scenes to influence senators and politicians and things like that, the same way that you did. But it doesn't seem to be working. And let me give you one example. In oil sands right now, 30% of the bitumen is being shipped out on process to the United States. That's loss of high technology, loss of jobs, loss of profits. That's going to go up to 50%, especially with the Keystone Pipeline. Somehow the message isn't getting through and we have to do much more so we can have things that benefit Canada. The same thing, if I can just very quickly comment, applies to South America. Resources are leaving the country without value added. Mm -hmm. Enrique? And then we'll come back to all of you. Okay, thank you. Um, this is particularly for uh, Tiffany and um, Patricio. Um, but I, I, let me try to organize some of so the, the interventions of, um, from everybody, because I think there's something about influence that we need to think about. So um, what are we influencing? And I think you can identify, you can influence people or through people, and I think you've all mentioned this. 
um, you can influence the processes of policy making, so how, how decisions are made, uh, whether there's consultation, whether it's done in private, what kind of inputs come in. You can influence the policies themselves, if we're limited in what we understand, the documents, the budgets, the, the programs. Um, and we can influence the politics, so the context in which, in which this, this happens. And, and I think the, so for instance, the, the work that uh, Institute of Ideas uh, does is quite interesting. And maybe my question to you is, could you tell us a bit more about the debates themselves that you organize? And then on the side of Patricio, uh, 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 Patricio the, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm, I'm, I'm Peruvian, so I know a little, little bit about Chile. But um, one of the major contributions of think tanks had in, in this return to democracy in Chile it wasn't necessarily just the intellectual bit, it wasn't the policy ideas, but it was that for a very long time, they, through uh, spaces of debate, of discussion, they educated the political elites and the public and themselves to debate and to discuss uh, and to do politics in a different way, maybe less confrontational, uh, allowed for coalition to form. And it'd be interesting to hear a bit about that, about the role of think tanks in Chile, in uh, not just in pushing ideas or sending people into, into the government once the Pinochet regime um, uh, was gone, but in terms of educating us all, educating the public and the elites to, to do democracy and to, and to participate. So let me sort of end this round with, uh, by adding a question that Andrew Cardozo, who heads the Alliance of sector councils in Canada sends uh, uh, through the web. Uh, something many of you touch on, what are the best ways to fund a think tank uh, so that it is independent and not beholden to any single funder, be it governments, corporations, or unions? So almost uh, speaking to your proposal. We have several such rich comments. Who wants to go first? I'll, I'll start. Um, one of the things we're trying to do, if you like, is shift, uh, is I'll, make, I'll make cultural shifts, which are much more intangible and more difficult to kind of identify how the hell you do it. But I'll try and give you an example. So one of the things we're really concerned about is something that most people will have noticed, which is that children just do not go out anymore. They are treated as if they are endangered species. You know, 30 years ago, they would have walked to school. Now they're driven. And this has come about not because of any increased danger particularly to children, but it's happened through a number of different social and cultural shifts. And that's one of the things we're trying to challenge. So there isn't really a direct policy you can put in place. I mean, you can't force everybody to abandon their children to walk to school on their own. You try and make it, try and make kind of, try and make people make those connections, expose the problem, and also maybe alert policymakers to policies that may be contributing to that problem. It may be highlighting some of the work that children's charities do. It may be highlighting some of the kind of protections that people have well intentionally put in place, but end up kind of making things worse. So that's one of the things we do. One way you can do that actually is by writing books, and I cannot agree with you more. Um, you can publish them quickly though, after you've spent a long time thinking, I mean, I wrote a book, it took me four years, and it was published in six months, whereas that same journal article is basically the book, but it still hasn't been published. So, but books allow people to set out their ideas a little bit more thoughtfully. And I'm absolutely convinced there's an appetite for it. You know, often when um, people ask about public engagement and when people talk about the way in which we live in a very instantaneous, you know, 140 character word characters in Twitter, we live in a very instantaneous culture, it's sort of assumed that that's what people want. And I don't think it is, actually, because everybody I know, and I do know some different people, um, want something a little bit more so sub substantial, and that's what we find with our debates. And basically, it's the main thing we do is the Battle of Ideas at the end of October. We do it with the art college, so it's out of conference environment. It's at the weekend. People from all different specialisms, even policymakers, sometimes come. But you basically have rows about all sorts of questions, including child safety, and we try and engage people on things that we think are important in that way. Who wants to go next? Does anyone, Antoine? Uh, so, question on uh, best way to fund uh, independent think tanks. I would really think that uh, I think in the short run, it's, it's it's better for think tanks to have quite a number of funders, uh, so many, so you uh, you are so independent that uh, any policy that you bring up 
just in case you brought up ideas that are controversial and the donor wants to pull out, he or she can pull out. So you need to have a number, not rely on one or two. Uh, the other way is uh, to have capacity, enough capacity, and, and, and uh, get your own income and, you know, in terms of uh, as work as a consultant, but on defined themes, having your own research agenda that, of course, is done uh, with consultation and, and uh, uh, involvement, so which is, which is uh, relevant, but something proactive or something that you have thought about rather than you relying a lot on commissioned work, on you know, people coming to you. So I would think the sustainability of think tanks um, in terms of uh, independence is, is not to rely on only one donor or two, to have so many uh, when they can pull out when they want, but also to have the capacity to go beyond donor man and get their own income through credibility. So being credible and having the capacity to be seen as, uh, you know, useful is really important because you'll have many people coming to you to do work for them. David, then Patricia. Okay, uh, if I could just echo what Antonio said, I really strongly agree with that. When it comes to um, the funding of think tanks, there are many different models. There's no one single model. Uh, I think let a, let a thousand flowers bloom, but a couple of principles are important. Independence from any one source of funding is important, especially government. What we've seen in Canada in, in recent times are those think tank-like organizations who have been exclusively funded by government have fallen by the wayside. Um, uh, they were not able to diversify their funding and they became victims of uh, uh, restraint or other, um, uh, other objectives of government. Uh, so the independence of the think tank is important. The models that exist include uh, those uh, th organizations that are fortunate enough to have large endowments, boy, that's beautiful. Wouldn't we all love that? Um, in, I'll just give you an example, Antonio. In my case, the Public Policy Forum is funded by our members. We're membership-based, multi-sectoral, and uh, the members join uh, simply because they support the cause of um, seeking good governance in the country. So there's an idealism associated with that, but I think there's a necessary idealism in any organization working in public policy as a think tank. Um, so I, I applaud you, and independence is the, is the key. Um, I'd just like to address yeah. the energy uh, question that came up. Uh, thank you for that question. I think your, your comment and question really reinforces why we need a Canadian energy strategy. You'll notice I'm using the term strategy, not policy. Um, I think policy would be ideal. Governments are going to have to come to terms with that. But even as a start for a building block, a framework or a strategy, I think would be a big step in the direction of the laissez-faire approach that's occurring right now. Patricia. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with the idea that uh, we people in the academics should bo do both, write papers on one side, and on the other side, we should be writing books for non-specialists talking about policy issues. Look, we can see now there is a boom on books on science for non-specialists. We, we see it and, and we buy those books and we like to read them. However, in, I would say, I don't know in Canada, but in Latin America, we would face two different problems. The first one, that at the university level, there are no incentives for doing so. Your promotion within the academic career, it doesn't give you any point related to having a book that tries to convey simple ideas, to explain simple ideas to public opinion. The second one is related to the attitude of the academic professors, that they would say, oh, this guy, he forgot about academic theory, that's the reason he's going this other way. So it's a, somehow something we have to overcome. Uh, respect to how, how do we do, I mean, think tanks a real contribution, pushing an idea. And I would speak by our uh, experience at CPLAN. And what we do, we do meet people at the parliament. It doesn't, uh, we don't care what ideological position they have. But at least in Chile, and I would say in most Latin America, they don't have technical staff 
to discuss with, with respect to the technical issues on specific uh, laws that are being discussed. So when you meet with them, I mean, and you provide them information, they really value that, and sometimes you do get to put some doubts on their ideological core about the issues they are discussing. So I think that interaction between academics and politicians, it's highly important, and I don't feel when I meet politicians or people in the parliament that I'm selling my soul in order to, by doing that. But I would say that there is another more productive way or highly more a, a, a mechanism that you could have much more influence. In my country now, there is a key problem related to education. Who put the education, the quality of education at college, at, at schools and at the universities? And who, who put that? We have tried to put that for many years at, at my think tank and at different think tanks, and we failed. But now the students put it by marching on the streets and if you have 200 to 300,000 students marching in the streets, they would put the issue of quality of education on the table. But then we require the researchers on the think tanks to come forward trying to spell out, okay, what are the real issues behind, behind the discussion on how to improve the quality of education? Do we know how to do it? Do we know how to measure the quality of education at higher education? I mean, that's, those are the issues we are being discussed there now in Chile. So it's something that I, uh, now we are uh, getting from the street, the type of issues in which we should be thinking. Thank you. I, I was hoping we'd have time for one more round, but I don't think we do because we've already eaten into Tom Burns' this time. So I simply wanted to sort of... Uh, acknowledge all of your very many thoughtful comments, thank the panelists for their thoughts, and, and uh, leave, leave us with perhaps one, which is that I, I began by saying that it might be that having all of these different environments represented on the panel, we might learn how, how much difference there is in different contexts. We've certainly done that, but along the way we've also come across some commonalities, and the two or three uh, that struck me were the lack of technical staff uh, among politicians and, and elected officials is common to many countries. Certainly the question of the paucity uh, of diverse funding is something that think tanks in rich and poor countries face alike, as well as the noise with which think tanks must compete, and I mean noise in a positive sense, that this is not some kind of easy task and we don't have an open line on wisdom or knowledge. So thank you all, and uh, join me in thanking the panel. That's a good point you ended on there. It's an extra, uh, very important. Please stay. I'm, 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 the program had me down for 30 minutes, but I want to assure you I'm not, uh, I'm not going to speak to, uh, for 30 minutes. In, in fact, um, I think this has been a, uh, a terrific day. Uh, a number of the questions which have been talked about today are, are, are questions which we wrestle with uh, in think tanks uh, all the time. I think, can think tanks make a difference? I think the answer is very clear that uh, for those of us who are uh, engaged in one way or another with think tanks, the answer is a clear yes. Uh, how uh, we can make more of a difference is, is a bigger question of which there are nuances, depends upon the context, uh, uh, the environment, and it's one we all wrestle with. I mean, I guess I first developed an interest in think tanks in, in particular in the early to mid 90s when I was G7 finance deputy in Canada and, and wrestling with a number of, of challenges globally and, and turn to the academic community, to, 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 to think tanks in Canada, looking for some additional thoughts, advice that could, that could help as we grapple with some of these questions. And, and frankly, I didn't find much out there. Um, either people weren't looking at those issues, or 
they were two years behind where the real policy debate was, uh, and that wasn't very helpful. I could go down to Washington, to Massachusetts Avenue, and see a few folk, uh, and there were more there, but they obviously brought a U.S. perspective to a, a lot of what uh, they were doing. And, and so, at that time, it was a, it was a frustration for me, and, and it was why I was uh, thrilled when in 2001 uh, the establishment of CG was announced because I thought at last in Canada we would have a think tank that would begin to address some of these broader global issues. Obviously within Canada we have other think tanks that, that focus on in other areas. We've had think tanks that look at domestic economic issues uh, or, or other issues but, but not ones that focused on, on broad uh, global issues. Um, a funny thing happened on my way to retirement a couple of years ago. I, uh, I thought I was, uh, was going to have some time to read these books that uh, people have been talking about, uh, only to get a call from, uh, from Jim Balsley and find myself uh, uh, here engaged with a, a think tank in terms of trying to figure out how we can make more of a difference. Um, I just had three or four thoughts I wanted to, to share with you on, on today. Uh, I mean, Roger Martin started off with some provocative comments, I mean, the question of how much evidence-based versus how much of a leap of faith should we have. Uh, Christia Freeland mentioned uh, George Soros and, and uh, instinct. Uh, somebody who used to work for George told me that, that uh, uh, in, in, um, in his company, he used to say, invest and then investigate. And indeed, this fund manager went to him one day, and this is a true story, and said, you know, I had a hunch, and I just, I just put $200 million on this. And George looked up at him and said, you're not very confident, are you? Um, it, it, it's how much you're prepared to, to sort of on a hunch, uh, invest and gamble, be prepared to lose is a, is a tricky question uh, uh, for a, a private company when, when uh, you're dealing with public policy issues. Uh, I think you need to have, have evidence, and I certainly tilt uh, towards those today who argue that, 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 that uh, think tanks need evidence to, to, to buttress uh, the arguments they're making. Uh, you know, having said that, uh, you know, often it's not the technical issues that, that are the biggest impediments to change. Uh, you know, we do a lot of research and occasionally, rarely, we may come up with a eureka moment when we've suddenly thought of something that nobody's ever thought of. Uh, but more often things are the way they are because, frankly, it's in the interest of some people to keep it that way. Uh, or there's just too much inertia in the system. And so it's not often finding that new eureka original thought so much as how does one Remarshal the arguments. Uh, how does one keep pushing uh, Maureen O'Neill, who is uh, uh, on our, our board, uh, said sort of a, a think tank, you know, trying to measure the impact of a think tank is like sort of water dripping onto a stone. Uh, you know, it takes a long time, but, but eventually you sort of, it, it wears away and you, and you can have um, some impact. Uh, you know, but it also, I think, is important is that process matters. And one has to look not just at the substance, but also at processes. And that certainly applies, I think, at CG, where we focus on global governance issues, which looks at structures and processes internationally, which can be impeding agreement. Um, and, 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 I mean, just to tie these two together, I mean, climate change is an area where I mean, frankly, the problems uh, and a number of the solutions have been known at this point for some, at least a couple of decades. It's not that, you know, we don't know what to do. Uh, the question is getting agreement amongst governments because it's, it's a global issue which cannot be addressed by any one government, and how do we do this? Uh, you know, I guess it was Machiavelli who said that, you know, the only really questions are process questions. I mean, how do we, we how can we restructure, uh, how can we facilitate uh, uh, discussions, dialogue, and eventually agreement uh, 
on these issues uh, is, is important. And so it's both the substance and it's the process. Uh, communications uh, is critical. It, it's interesting. We have a, uh, and I have a lively debate with Ore about books. Uh, so I know he was being thrilled with some of the comments some people uh, make. I guess I have, and I said when I came here, that, that you know, if we're a think tank trying to affect the policy process and in, in, in the policy elite and, and decision makers, uh, I don't know many people in those positions, frankly, unfortunately, who have time to read a lot of books. I mean, that was one of the things I was looking forward to when I thought I was going to retire, that finally I'm going to have some time uh, to read, as I said. But, but you know, if you've worked for a minister, I mean, you know, you've got to get that down on one page. Uh, and, and these are complex issues in many cases, but, but you know, if you're trying to deal with, with policy makers, you've got, uh, I think people made earlier today, the, you know, the point that, that, that timing is critical. Uh, it is critical. There are certain windows that open up when you can't influence uh, the policy debate. Uh, and, you, and you've got to be in there. And, and a big book that may come out three years later, uh, it may be terrific, uh, but if it just comes out after that window is closed or just sits on a shelf, it's not going to have any impact. Um, you know, impact is, is important. And in, 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 uh, I think for a, a think to impact, influence. Um, and so, you know, we need to, to target our various audiences. I mean, there are the decision makers. There's also the broader public and, and, and the role the think tanks play. But, but different communication tools are needed for the different audiences. And, and uh, uh, you know, and so, you know, whether it's, you know, policy briefs or slightly longer, you know, analytical pieces or podcasts or, or you know, are into blogging or tweeting. Uh, I mean, these are all part of it, but, but communications is absolutely critical uh, to impact. I remember one of the first meetings I had here at CG with, with, uh, with people involved and, and we were talking about something and I said, well, you know, we need to consider what impact this is going to have, and, and somebody put up their hand and said, is that really what we're trying to do? I mean, we thought we were just here to generate ideas for the world, and it was their responsibility to pick it up, and I must admit, I was, I was stunned. Um, I thought for a think tank that's trying to get out there, that, 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 that having some impact was, was absolutely fundamental. Uh, both to purpose, but also in terms of assessing, uh, which is a difficult challenge, but assessing whether you're, you're being, um, being successful. Uh, it's interesting, David, you mentioned this think tank spending 50% on communication, and there's a study done looking at think tanks in the United States uh, you know, over the last two decades, and what is interesting is that what was spent on communications as I understand, it went from about 10% of budgets of think tanks about 20 years ago to an average now of about 30% uh, percent with some spending a lot more. I mean, they're clearly, in the U.S., I mean, it has been a shift to say, no, we need to focus on fewer ideas where we can have impact uh, and we're going to market those, we're going to communicate those, and debate the difference between those, but, but that's what we need to do. I mean, that's also a company, obviously, a politicization of of the think tanks, and, and one has to, uh, uh, to bear that in mind. But, but uh, uh, these are, are uh, I think, all, uh, all elements of, of what we need to consider as we go forward. Uh, with those few remarks, let me just thank uh, everybody who participated today, the, 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 uh, the chairs of the sessions, the various contributors, uh, Neve and Fred, uh, who uh, uh, co-chaired the process to put this together, uh, uh, our events people who always do such an amazing job, uh, our IT people, everybody else at CG who's been involved in this, and, uh, and thank you to all of you for having uh, participated. And uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, we're glad you were able to come to CG and help celebrate uh, this anniversary with us, and we look forward to seeing you here again on another occasion. Thank you. <laughs>